Okay, good evening everyone. Does everyone sat comfortably? Yeah. Yeah, we're good. Because we're going to talk about your comfort zone, so that's good. Right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Amen. Right. <laughs> um, I'm learning to pray shorter, so it's going to be good. So, um, we're going to look at a passage of scripture that I spoke a little bit about on Monday. And I'm going to try not to preach too much. I would like to teach. But I can't guarantee that. Um, but we're going to look at Acts 20, verse 7 onwards. So if you've got a Bible, turn there. I'm going to read it out in a minute. So it says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together, and in a window sat in a um, in a window sat a certain young man named, I know this, Eutychus, who was sink, um, sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by the sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up there. We're going to look at this message, and we're going to break it into three parts. The first part is, they met on the first day. I want to talk a little bit about that. The second part is, Paul was ready, and the third part is, a kid fell out of the window. All right, and they're the three kind of things we want to look at. All right. So when we read the Bible, we need to soak it in, don't we? We need to look at the Word of God, and we need to realize that when the Word is being written, whoever wrote it, they wrote things in there for a reason. And we've learned this, haven't we, before, where where we draw a lot of things out of the Word of God, and then um, as we read it, when we see something that looks a bit peculiar, a bit odd. We can sometimes just ignore it and think, oh, someone just wrote that in there by accident. But it's never there by accident. There's always something, especially, especially if it looks odd, and I'll bring that up a little bit later, that we draw out. But if there's details, for example, in there, just have a little look at it, because you can draw so much. I could preach on just that first line for an hour. And I'm not going to, but I could. And so the first line is that they met on the first day of the week. What's the first day of the week? All right, genius. What's the people's, what do people, um, what's people's perception of what they think is the first day of the week? Monday. A Monday. What do you think the world's viewpoint is of what the first day of the week is? Monday. It's a Monday. And, and that is not true. But the problem is we live with an attitude and a mindset that Monday is the first day of the week. We are in a world where, where Monday is set up so much to fail, but God didn't actually intend it to be that way. And we end up with the Monday the way they are, which then kind of messes up the rest of our week, and then we just think we get to the Friday, and then start all over again. But I want to just give you a little bit of an insight that if you can get this right, if you can get this thing turned the right, right way around, and it isn't going to happen overnight, but through a process, that you can get a lot more balance into your week and understanding. So they met on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. One of the questions we get, and if you're a new Christian, you might have this question, is why do we meet on a Sunday? Does anyone know why we meet on a Sunday? Other than usually a leader says we meet on a Sunday, that's how it rolls, see you next week. Does anyone actually know why the Sunday? Because the first day of the week is a Sunday school answer, but yeah, we'll take it. Um, that's what it is. No. Well, well, let's see what he's saying. It's to do with the resurrection. Because what happened was Jesus was resurrected on a Sunday, and the disciples, when the church got planted, the church got set up, they chose Sunday, which happened to also be the first day of the week, because God chose it as the resurrection day, to, to be the day that they were going to choose to celebrate and acknowledge Jesus Christ. So if anyone ever asks you, say, what do you mean on a Sunday? Usually our answer is, I don't really know the reason, I was just told to turn up. And I've been turning up ever since. That's how we do it. But the reality is, there is a reason for it. And there's a reason why. The other, the other question that comes is, if the Sabbath was one thing, and church is now sort of replaced that old system, why is church on a Sunday and not on a Saturday? Why is the Sabbath not replaced? You heard that question? Well, I'm going to answer it for you. Because they're two very, very different things. 
One is the first day of the week, and one is the last day of the week. Jesus, or God, at the beginning of time, creation, on the first day of the week, started to put in motion the creation of the universe, the world, that we know. It's the beginning of something. The first day of the week is the start of a process. But the Sabbath is not a Jewish thing. Do you know that? It's not Jewish. It's become Jewish and it's labelled Jewish. But do you know who invented it? Do you know who came up with it? God. And I want to sort of suggest to you, and the other thing is, if anyone ever says to me, and I've had this question a few times, but anyone ever says to me, why is church, why is the day of rest now on a Sunday and not on a Saturday? I'd be like, are you joking? Do you actually go to church? Do you actually get involved in church? Are you actually even a Christian? Because, do you know, to a day of rest is a day of rest. And if you are have anything to do with church, if you're ever involved in church, there is no such thing as a day of rest on a Sunday. If you go to church, you are not rested, are you? So in our mentality, in our world, in our nation in particular, everyone sees Sunday as a day of rest. And that's how we've been brought up in our culture, and actually that's where we say, why is our day of rest on a Sunday and not on a Saturday? But if you have a lifestyle to walk with Christ and be part of the mission that God gives us, which is church, then it is not a day of rest. The church, the gathering on the Resurrection Sunday, every Sunday is a Resurrection Sunday, is not the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day of rest. And we need to implement both. We don't, I'm not talking about us implementing the Sabbath in a religious way or trying to say, right, get your Jewish gear and we're going to do something on Saturday. I'm just saying about your week, however you want to look about it, God himself, God himself had to have a rest. We're talking about God. God's the one that says, you come to me and I will give you rest. God himself had a rest. So how do we think that we've got to run through from Monday all the way through to Sunday as Christians just running around doing 101 things at 100 miles an hour and, and actually feel condemned sometimes when we need a break or we need to calm it down? It's balance. We need balance. And the Sabbath, I'm using the word Sabbath because it's what the word is, but the rest day is something we all need to make sure we implement into our everyday life. And I just want to give you the, the wording from... Um, the Greek or the Jewish language. And there's a word called the Havdalah. And the Havdalah is the piece that's in between the Sabbath and the first day. And it's that little gap in between where they're waving goodbye, effectively, to the Sabbath. They're saying goodbye to their rest, and now they're beginning the first day of the week. It's the departure of the Sabbath. So you see, if we can get in our heads, if we can change our mindset, which might take a while, to get into the process that I'm having a rest, I'm chilling out, I'm spending time with my family, I'm gonna spend some time with the Lord, catch up with a bit of whatever it is you're catching up with, do a bit of DIY, whatever it might be, but you're not kind of 100 miles, one miles now having to throw yourself into ministry, or whatever you want to call it, and you treat it as a day of rest, then when you come to the first day of the week, as God intended, you're coming to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. But you treat the first day of the week as the day you go to work, the day that's gonna suck, the day that's gonna go wrong, the day that you're waiting for everything to fail. But if the first day of the week for all of us is the attitude of, I've had my rest, I've had what I needed, I've recouped, and now I'm entering the resurrection, I'm entering the first day of the week, I'm beginning my week now, then actually a Monday becomes the Tuesday and you're already into your week. Do you see how God's plan is if you get this kind of in, in line with what he's already put in place at the very beginning, we're talking about the very first chapters of the Bible, if we put this into our lifestyle, the balance that we need, then suddenly the, the hassle and stress and all the things that come with having to work on a Monday morning change. Because you set yourself up not to say goodbye to the weekend and hello Monday, but you say goodbye to your Sabbath, so goodbye to your day of rest, goodbye to your recuperation, or whatever it might be. 
Hello Resurrection Sunday, hello celebration together with my family, hello the time of serving, the time of receiving, the time of ministry. And that's your first day of the week. It's a pretty good first day of the week. Do you see how God has set that up? The first day of the week is Sunday, not Monday. And I'm going to, I've been very sneaky, but not sneaky, 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 like naughty sneaky. But I've been spending a bit of time with the Lord, and I've been reading a brilliant book. And, and one of the books is, well, part of the books, it says that it's really important to make sure we get those rest days in. If you're a leader, and I believe everyone's a leader, because everyone has to be somebody and do something. If you're leading people, you're doing something in people's lives. If you're a mother, you're a leader. Yeah, we, we our, our time needs to be passed on. Our time is need, someone needs our time. If you're a father or a grandfather, you're, you're a leader. You know, we are in that way of, of having a lifestyle that requires for us to actually look at the way that our week works and make sure that there is downtime in it. Because if God needs it, if God puts it in his calendar, then we surely need to put it in our calendar. And so, one of the things I've been sitting down with the Lord over the last few, three or four um, months, and one of the things I put out to the membership, I said, look, in September time-ish, we're going to meet as a, uh, a membership, and we're going to make some decisions to do some things. Between now and then, I would like you to pray, see the Lord, ask the Lord what you'd like to do, what you think the need is in the church. Come and see me, we'll meet together, we'll pray together, and if we feel like it's right, we'll present it to the church membership, and then we'll start it around about October, which is what we're in now. And so I have to look at everything that we are doing as a church, but also I need to look at us as a church. How are we functioning as a church? Who's the people we've got in the church? What, what have we, what, how does it work? So what's happened is in the last two or three months, people came up to me and they said, Could I, I really feel God's called me to do something. I really feel like to do this, and someone else comes up and do this. Or someone says, there's a, I see that there's a need, how do you think we should meet it? And so we walk together, we plan these things out, and then we present it to the membership. And starting last week, we put in place programs that actually ended up us doing something on every single night of the week and a couple of things in the day. And one of the things when I was sat with the leadership, I said, look, I'd really like us as a leadership to get together and do some stuff where we're studying together, so we're not just talking business all the time. We want us to talk spiritual, we want to talk about Jesus. Let's get together on a regular basis around the Word of God. And one of the suggestions was, oh, maybe Saturday would be a good day. And I said, we're not going to do Saturdays. And it was nothing to do with Jewish. People need to really understand that. I don't, I'm not acknowledging the Sabbath is a religious thing. But I said, when I look at the way our week works, when I look at our church with a bunch of young families and a bunch of men and women at work, nine to five, Monday to, Saturday, uh, Monday to Friday, that they don't, and there's a commitment that we expect them on a Sunday. It'd be a bit harsh if we put a little programs and things on a Saturday and expect them to turn up or be disappointed if they won't turn up. So actually, the way it's worked, without it being, so that's what I said about being sneaky, is that it ends up that on the very Saturday that is acknowledged as the Sabbath, the day of rest that God acknowledged Himself, we actually just within our calendar is, have set that day aside. And so we already have, just really by complete accident, I can't take any glory for it, you have in place the pattern that God has intended to put from the beginning of the time, which we're going to rest on this day, we're going to start creating on this day. Day one, we're going to start getting creative. That's life. Monday is day two, not day one. And if we can get that in our mindset, maybe Monday mornings will be a little bit different. Maybe our attitude won't be like, we're waving goodbye to the weekend, or no. We'll be saying, I've already waved goodbye to my rest a day ago. I'm already pumped because I've got to, I've got to be around my family. I've got to be in a place where I was um, celebrating my King, my Lord, my Saviour, because it's the resurrection day. And then, do you know what? You get to do it all over again the following week. That's just a little bit of a bonus. That's not really part of the story, but I just want to say, do you see how much you can get out of online at work? Do you see how much you can do? You can do that. Number two, really short, Paul says this, or he says this about Paul. He says, Paul, ready to depart the next day, he spoke to them and continued his message till midnight. The other thing I really want to highlight is Paul was ready. Paul was already serving the Lord in the thing that God had put in front of him, but he was already ready to go and do the next thing, whatever it was that God had led him to do. And I just want to challenge, as a quick challenge, that 
God is adding to our church daily. You know when we read, uh, or let's say weekly for now, um, when we read the, the, the Bible, the New Testament, and we read about every church, it says the church was added to daily because they gathered together and people were just getting coming. That's what we're seeing happening on a, on a weekly basis. People are coming through the doors, people are turning up. We've been praying for this, we've been asking God to do this for decades, and not just because in this church. I think anyone that's been born again in their faith, at some point is just saying, God, give me the lost. Send me somebody, give me somebody, I want to see people stay. We've been asking for this prayer, and God is sending, sending them in. But the one thing I'm a bit curious about is, are we really, really ready for those people? Are we really ready to receive them? Have we got things set up? One of the things that really disappointed me personally for myself was I didn't set up salvation packs. Because I've known about this for a long time. I've got no illusion about what God is going to do. I have no lack of faith. I totally believe that God will save people. I totally believe that God will send people through. I totally believe that God will fill this place with people. And that God will heal them. And we'll see deliverance. And we'll see all sorts of crazy things going on in the name of the Lord. And we'll see transformation. And we'll see people queuing up to get into the church. We'll see all sorts of things happening. I have no, no illusion of that. But having known that, I still wasn't ready for what happened on Saturday, Sunday. When people wanted to give their hearts to the Lord. And we as a church need to be ready. We need to be able to say, you made a, a really bold and brave decision, but we just want to give you a little bit more information that will help you get through the week until we meet again. And we weren't even ready for that, and yet we've been praying for it, we've been starting to see glimmers of it, and yet are we really ready? Are we ready to take on what's coming? And just, that's just a personal challenge for you guys to think about. Am I ready? And if I am we're ready, and it doesn't mean ready as in, have I got everything, like, have I got my app together? Because that's never going to happen. I think we should have. You should have got enough information from that from the message on Sunday. We're never going to get our act together. God's going to use us in our mess and our issues to get through things. It's not about getting your act together. It's just saying, are you available? Are you available to say to God, what do you need me to do? What, are, what do you need me to, to be, to, to, what do you want to use me for? It's not my will, but your will. So just a challenge, just God is starting to do something here. As we're seeing God do a move like we've been waiting for, Ian comes up to me every Sunday. And he says, do you think we can call it revival yet? I say, not yet. <laughs> but it's getting there. It's getting there. But, we're, but what I'm saying is, we're, are we really ready? And, and, and so we're starting to see things happening. What happened last night, there was like 11 people here receiving discipleship, is remarkable. Ian just said to me, I've never seen people just want to come and turn up to a meeting and learn about the Word of God in a long, long, long time. God is doing something. But as God is doing something, are we actually reacting to that? Or are we just thinking, this is nice? And then one day it's just going to blow up and it's going to go nuts and we're just going to be like, we should have been more prepared. Or we can just be prepared now. Gemma's been bothering me the last week or so saying, can I just come and sort some covers out? Can I just get some? That's preparation. Yeah, it's just prepar preparation so that when we get to do something, it's organised, it's ready. Little things make a big difference. We went and sorted out the crash the other day because we said, the, it's changed from having a couple of babies in an area now to we've got to make more space, so we, we had to adjust it. We have to be proactive. So are we really ready in the things that God is doing and sending to us? It's just a challenge for you to think about personally. Are you ready in that way? So one, number one, first day of the week. Number two, are we ready? And then we get to the main cusp of the message, really. And that's this. We're talking about this young man. So it says, and he continued his message until midnight, and there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together, and in the window sat a certain young man named um, Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was basically dead, taken dead, he was dead. And we know he's dead because Luke is a physician and he wrote this. So Luke's not gonna lie, he's dead. Okay, so, unfortunate, obviously. But there's three lessons, and this is really the, the, the main part of the story. The, the title of this message, if you have a title for it, is your comfort zone will kill you. Your comfort zone will kill you. If you want that as a, as a title, you want to write that down, your comfort zone will kill you. And there's three lessons within this story that we're going to draw out. There's three reasons why this young man ended up dying. And we're going to relate this to a spiritual, which is what we do with the Word of God. We're going to relate it from what we're reading to turn it into a spiritual message for us and how we can relate to it. So number one 
is it says at midnight, he spoke, continuing the message at midnight, and there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together, and in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. The first question here is, his timing and his commitment and his attitude was off. You see, I can imagine that this is a young man and that he was probably a Jew because most of these people would have been Jews at this moment. And he's heard the message, someone's preached the message, maybe you heard Peter's first sermon, something happened there, and he's heard the message of, of Jesus and someone's, and then he said, I've, I've received this Jesus in my heart, what do I do next? And somebody, like they would have done with you, he said, well, what we do next is we go to church on Sundays. And so what he's doing is he's turning up to church on Sunday because he thinks that's what he's got to do. And the reason that is is because if you were part of Judaism at that point, it was very religious and very structured. We know this because Jesus was always picking into it and, and showing things out. And the religion that was overriding the, the message that Jesus was trying to teach was the religion, the man-made religion was getting in the way. And so they, he's come out of a system that basically says, we've got a bunch of rituals and a bunch of things that we need to do. He's now come into the liberty in Christ, but he doesn't quite, hasn't got quite that mindset yet to say, uh, um, like, well, how does it work? He's just saying, well, what's the religious system now? I picked a different religion. What's the religious system now? And someone said to him, well, what we do is we gather on a Sunday. And actually this week in your local church, we've got Apostle Paul coming. Can you imagine that? That'd be great when Paul's coming to speak. And so he's turned up, but we can see that his commitment and his attitude is a little bit wrong. He's a young man. It says about him that Paul spoke till midnight, but he's a young man. It says he's a young man, so there's no reason for him to be tired. There's no reason. It doesn't say he's had an illness. It doesn't say there's anything wrong with him. It just says he was a young man that fell asleep fell out the window. So we can look at that. First of all, he came with the wrong attitude. Have we ever turned up to church? It's all right. We'll keep it between us. Have we ever turned up to church with the wrong attitude, where we have, where we're tired, where we're not really switched on, but we're just going because that, we were told that's what we got to do. We got to go on a Sunday. We got to gather on that meeting, so I'll go. But I'm not really switched on. Actually, when you come, you don't, you don't hear a word that's being said. The songs are being sung, but it's like you're, you're, just, you're, you're lip syncing, but you're not really involved. You're just there because you, you've been told to be in church, to be a Christian. You go to church. And so we know that he's turned up, you don't have to put your hands up, I'll just assume you all have. But we can have that. You can look at this young man, this young lad, he's turned up and he's put himself in a position where he's come with the wrong attitude, he's come with the wrong mindset because he thinks it's about still following the system and the rituals of what Judaism was before, which is you follow the little things to get approval from God, as where in the liberty of Christ is different. And I've just told you why they gather on Sunday. So we know that he hasn't gathered on Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of, of Christ. He hasn't gathered on Sunday to be around his fellowship and be anything because he's already set himself up to fall asleep. He's already set himself up to say, I'll be here, but I'm not really here. So his attitude was wrong. So number one, his attitude was wrong and his commitment was wrong. So uh, one of the things like I just said earlier is we've set our week up now. It's just the way it's worked out. But you now have a choice because you know, hang on a minute, the whole church, just through complete accident really, are going to be resting and chilling on this day. That means what else is the church doing the rest of the week? Can I be there? Can I encourage? Can I turn up? Can I, can I get involved? Can I, whatever it is, there's a, there's a, we can look at our week now and we can balance it out. And one of the things I think is really important for all of you to do, and I really mean that, like really go and do this is sit down with God, put your timetable out. For some of you, you've got to put in like an automatic slot of I'm at work these hours. You know, you can't suddenly say, I'm wiped it clean, bring up your work, and say, is it all right if you can still pay me, I've changed my hours, I'm going to do different hours. It's not going to work that way. So we know that there's some things that are set in place. We've got to take the kids to school, we've got to, whatever it is. God's okay with that. Grace, there's grace in that. He's not like saying, well, I'm sorry, what are you doing? But sit down with God, look at your week, and get balanced, because one of the things that's really been a struggle for me, and I don't know if you're quite there yet, but you, you will get there if you don't get this right, is God puts a call on our heart. He puts a call on your heart that it just overwhelms you in such a way 
that you see the loss the way God sees the loss. You, you want to devote time and energy into people's lives. You want to put effort into the lives of complete strangers because God has put that burden into your life. And yet, for me, I have a commitment, a promise that I've made to my wife and to my children that seems to me that I'm like, God, you've given me this weight and this burden, and yet I have this commitment that I've agreed to be part of. It's not like a burden, it's a commitment. But you put this weight on my shoulders, you put this thing, and it doesn't quite match up. How am I supposed to do all the things you've given me and stick with and honor my commitment? How can I invest a bunch of time into, say, some teenagers and completely not invest any such time in the same time, in the same sense with my own children? How can that even be possible, God? But I feel like you're in this. And if you're doing stuff in this, how does it work? I've had to have that confliction with God over and over again until I really listen. And all I had to hear was God say to me, your balance is all over the place. You know everything I've given you, all the people that I've sent you, you can handle all of that. You can deal with all the jobs, all the things that I've given you, but your balance is all wrong. Everything that you're trying to do is within your own timetable, and then you're trying to squeeze in the things that should be valuable to you, and then it's all over the place because it doesn't work. And he said, you need to get balance. And that's why I sat down with God for the whole church. To sit down and say, God, okay, if we plan this out right now, these are the things that people have shown me that they're, they're hungry for, they want to get involved in. But where's the balance in that? How do we make sure that people have balance in their lifestyles and what they're doing to make sure that they're not just running around after a bunch of strangers and then they're neglecting maybe their families or just themselves? And we see so many times, if you've ever been in church, or you know of people that burn themselves out, running around, leaving churches over and over again for people, because they think that's what they're meant to do. Well, actually, we've got, already got the model at the beginning of creation of God saying, yeah, there's a bit of work to be done. Yes, you're going to be creative in your week, but there is a place of rest. There is a place of balance. And one of the things that came up was when some of this stuff was going on, um, I mentioned that on Monday that we and Paige were going to put some toys out and look after some kids and all that kind of stuff because we saw the ministry that was about to happen. Who could have imagined what was going to happen on this Monday? But we saw what was coming. And I remember we just put on saying, oh, we're just going to run this group. And a few people just said, oh, like, you're, you're going to burn yourself out. This is crazy. You're doing 101 things. Like, what are you doing? And I said, I said, no, I think you got it wrong. Because I've been sat down with God for three months planning this. And actually, do you understand I'm going to be doing a lot less? Not more, I shouldn't be saying this really, because I get paid. But I'm actually going to be doing a lot less. Because do you know what's happened in the three months that we've been trying to rearrange and organise how we're going to go forward as a church? People have sought the Lord for themselves, and they stepped up and they said, I'll take that one. I want to do that. I want to run that. So I, uh, my burden is I see a bunch of people coming in and say, God, all these people need discipleship. How am I going to do that? Ian and Anton, I'm sure to say, we always really wanted to run a discipleship course, can we do it? Amen. Of course you can. Do I need to turn on that night? No. I trust them, they know I need to be there. I could be there if I can't be there, but I don't need to be there because I've got people I can trust running it, but also called to be doing it. Tash, Paige get back from camp, they get all excited, they ring me up and they regret it the minute they've done it. They say, we've got a great idea, we've got to want to do this. I say, that's brilliant. Let's talk about it. Let's meet up. The next first time I met up with them, they're like, is there any way we can get out of this? Is it set in stone yet? You know? Because the scary thing is, is when we, when we know God's called us, we can keep it to ourselves, can't we? But once we say out of our mouths, I think God's told me to do something, and then we, everyone's aware of it, then it becomes a reality, and then, wow. But God used you first week last week brilliantly, and it's going to be awesome going forward. I don't need to be there. I don't need to run it, I don't have to think about it. But three months ago, I had to think about every teenager that potentially could come in, all my the kids that were growing up to be part of that. I had to think about the discipleship of all the adults that God was sending in. I had to think about all these things. And suddenly, actually, God has started to balance my life out. Yesterday, I got to have a day, a night, a day, an evening with my family for the first time in a very long time, where it was just really enjoyable to go out with my family, and I felt, Wow, God, for the first time, probably in two years, I feel balanced. 
like really balanced. And, I, and then I realised, this is your plan. This is your plan for every single one of us to get that balance in our lives where there's rest and there's enjoyment and then there's hard work. It's all of it. And it's in God's plan. Where was I saying? Oh, just about your timing. Just about your commitment. Seeking the Lord. What can I do? If I'm going to turn up, why am I turning up? God, what is your will? How do you want me to do this? Just get that attitude of the Lord. The second one, right, I preached the message on Sunday, um, and a few people come up to me and they said that was great, it was really good, changed me, did a new, did something new, I've never heard anything like that before. People even gave their lives to the Lord, you know, it's brilliant stuff. If I went onto Facebook afterwards, and, I, and somebody was writing up an article, okay, um, you know, like a little message, oh, I went to church this morning, oh, it was awesome, I think Rich spoke, and then they started saying things like, but, you know, what was amazing was the lighting, the lighting just blew me away, the way the lighting worked was just awesome, you know, the way the lasers worked during the worship, you know, the way that the spotlight worked during the preaching, it just was awesome, the, the lighting effects would just set the mood, I'd be a little bit disappointed, I'd be like, I did preach a message and I thought that would be the thing, not the highlight, but I thought that might get a bit of a mention. But you're just telling me about the, the decorations and the, the way the church building looks and, and that's what they're doing here. You're talking about Apostle Paul has come to town and he has turned up and he's preaching a message and it says, there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. This is one of those moments in the Word of God where you read it and you think, couldn't you just delete that? Couldn't we just have left that out? What was the point of having that in? Really, what? Why do we need to know? Was it because you know Luke, maybe maybe Luke wrote it and he's it was one of his family members he was trying to show off? He was like, oh yeah, anyway, my mother-in-law's Paul went all out into town and Paul was going around put all the laps out. You know, what was the purpose of it? We don't really know. We don't really know why it's in there. But I do. I'll tell you. There were many lamps in the upper room. You know, lamps in those days were like candles, they were lit, but they also involved incense. So what, what they're trying to say is, before we get to the conclusion of this story, we're also trying to explain part of the reason why this happens to this young child. Because there's a load of lamps, and every lamp is lit, it's candles, it's dimly lit, you know, and, and also there's a load of incense burning. Now I don't know about you, but if you ever go around someone's house where it's quite dimly lit, you know, the heat is probably on full blast, and there's incense burning. You want to fall asleep, don't you? Have you ever done those? I just me. Has anyone ever gone to a place where you feel like that? And, and, and so, what, what, what Luke is trying to say in this passage, he's saying, actually the room had a bunch of lamps, and there was a load of incense burning, and, and it was hot. We know it's hot because the kid was sat by the window, or in the window. So you, you know what's going on. And Luke sets it up because he's trying to explain why this happens to the child. But the spiritual meaning for this, the spiritual explanation is the atmosphere was wrong. There was a wrong atmosphere impacting and affecting this young child. And in the Word of God, it talks about sleep. And it says, um, in, the word of, yeah, in the Word of God, in the Word of sleep, it says that sleep, spiritually meaning, is to yield to sin or to yield to the flesh. So when we realise that this child was struggling to stay awake, and then we realise that there was an atmosphere being created by the candles and the incense being burned, and that, that that caused him to want to fall asleep, that this atmosphere was being created and it was causing him to yield in the flesh. You see, right in that moment, you've got Paul preaching the sermon, they're gathering on the Resurrection Sunday, and yet he is allowing the atmosphere that's being created in that place to impact his life to the point that he will fall asleep. And that word to fall asleep is to, is to yield to sin, to, to, what was I saying? Oh yeah, to yield to the flesh, to give it to the flesh. And my challenge here for you is, what is your influence? What's your atmosphere? What do you have around you that impacts and affects you that you end up succumbing and yielding to the flesh. 
You see, if we put the wrong things around us, and we have the wrong things in front of us, and we, there's an atmosphere being created, it will impact and affect your walk with God to the point where you end up bowing the knee, that's what healed means, to the flesh, to sin. Let's take, for example, you don't need to, you need to be an overly positive person, but you're just not a negative person. But you hang around with negativity long enough, you will become a negative person. If someone is telling you you're not good enough, you're not going to do that, you're not going to cook, what are you doing that for? Why are you picking that for? What are you being that for? Why did you do that for? Why do you wear that for? All these things over and over again in your life, eventually, if that is the thing that you're allowing over and over and over again to be the voice in your head, the voice that tells you these negative things, you know what will happen to you? You'll become a negative person. You know, a lot of us have habits because of the way we were brought up, good or bad. Because we hung around with the people that put those things in us, whether it was good morals or bad morals. We got them. Because it was implemented into us over a time, and that's what we became. If you sat around a bunch of people, and when you first get together with them, they start saying, oh, did you see what she was wearing? Did you see what he was wearing? Did you see the way, oh, did you, oh I didn't like, I didn't like, what they said, I didn't, you know, oh, did you see the makeup? They missed their lips, it was all over the place. And, and, and like, oh, I don't like her, she's a horrible person. And there's this, this attitude of gossip. And at first, sometimes you have that mentality of saying, I don't know if I feel like this is the right people to hang around with, but you have that moment. But your flesh is like, I like to talk about this, I want to know more, I want to find out more. And so what you do is you implement yourself into those circles of people to the point that eventually you become a gossip. If you allow the atmosphere to change you, it will cause you to yield to sin. This is what was happening to this man, this young man. He's in this position, he's in this place, and actually at this moment, all the stuff that's going on, this, 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 these lamps, is creating an atmosphere that's causing him to yield to his flesh. If Jesus was to walk through that door now, and he said, can I look at your iPhone to see what the content is on it, your songs, your internet, your movie that you watched, would you be like, no worries, have a go? Or would you be like, um, hmm, could I just have it for a moment before I give it to you? And you don't need to answer, because then we're going to have a conversation. But, what would your, where would you be at with that? What, how, how does that work? Is there things that you think, do you know what? I can't work out why I keep getting square words in my head. I can't work out why I hang around the church all day, I hang around people all the time, but for some reason, swear words just keep coming into my head. And then you realise that you've got these things in your ears, listening to music that's got that little E next to it with explicit language, and you're listening to it happen. If you allow that to influence you, if you allow that to be part of who you are, eventually it's who you will become. And what goes in the head will finally come out of your mouth. And then when it starts to come out of the mouth, you won't stop. The atmosphere we create around us, the influences that we have around us, impact our flesh. They influence our flesh if they're governed by the flesh, if they're pointing to the flesh. If we allow the things of the spirit around us to encourage us, the people that will encourage and lift us up, they will encourage and they will cause us to bow their knee to the spirit. Does that make sense? No? Okay. Number two, number three, last bit. And it says this, and in the window sat a certain young man. Have you ever put yourself in a location that's completely stupid? Yeah? This is a stupid location, isn't it? He's put in a position of like, he's put himself in a dumb location. He's already come in with the wrong mindset. He's already tired and the atmosphere is already affecting his flesh. And then what he does is he sits in the window. Now the reality is if you turn up with an attitude that you don't, you're not really focusing on why you're there and the atmosphere is going to affect you and you're then going to locate yourself in a window, an open window, the, the reality is you're probably going to fall asleep and fall out of the window. And he locates himself in a stupid position. We can all relate to this because we make stupid decisions to locate ourselves in places we should not be. You see, can we, if we 
take this in the context of what was going on in this whole, the whole picture of it, was this young man in the wrong place? Was he in the wrong place? You can answer that. No. He was exactly where he should be. He was exactly where God wanted him to be. He was exactly where God designed him to be. He was there on Resurrection Sunday, as we've already explained, there to celebrate the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, to listen to this guest preacher that was coming in to speak. He was there, and it was the right place to be. But he was in the wrong location. He was in the right place to be, but he was in the wrong location. He was right here, in this building, and yet his location was wrong. He put himself in a position of, of where his poor choices and decisions were going to lead him to his death, and yet he was only one simple decision away from being able to be put in a place of life. And that was, if I arrive with a different attitude, and I allow the atmosphere around me to be different, rather than the atmosphere that's being created right now to influence me, that I would I would allow myself to be put into a place that's going to change that influence and encourage my atmosphere. And if I was willing to just move my location from a window, which I could fall out of, to maybe put myself at the feet of Paul, being around the people that might be encouraging him with the word, that would encourage me in what I'm hearing, that would equip me to hear what I need to hear. If my location was just slightly different then what seems or we know ends up as a sentence of death could have been so easily a situation of life. You see, how many of us, I see it so many times, I hear it so many times where people say, I want to be committed to the church, I want to come along, I want to be part of what's going on. You say, brilliant, see you Sunday, turn up, brilliant, come along, embrace the Lord, soak it up, worship Him. That would be great. And they turn up, they come to the place, the exact place that they need to be, but they locate themselves, whether it's spiritually, mentally, or physically, in a position that they cannot receive life. They turn up with an attitude and a mindset that says, I haven't really asked if this was God's will or not, I'm just here because I thought I had to turn up because that's what we do on a Sunday. And then I've turned up with a bad attitude, because the atmosphere around me, the people around me, the situations, the influences I allow to affect me, cause me to think things I should, probably shouldn't. And then when I do turn up, where I could allow the opportunity for the Spirit of God to break through, for maybe the person who's preaching His Word to break through, for, the, for God to do something in me, I locate myself somewhere else. I put myself outside. I put myself on the window ledge. And I think we can all relate to that. I think we can all relate to that, where we've come into a place where we go to church at times and we're there, but we're not there. There's three lessons in this. Wrong attitude, wrong atmosphere, wrong location. Just look at your lives and say, God, am I, am I, are those things right in my life? And if they're not, just tweak them. You see, all he had to do was when he arrived, say, do you know what, I'm going to go and find out what this poor chap's chatting about, and plonk himself right bang in the centre of the people that were listening to Paul talk. And if Paul was talking, it would have transformed his life, I'm pretty sure we know what Paul says, what things he says. He was so close to the words of life, and yet he was allowing the atmosphere of that place to impact him in such a way that it caused him death. Wrong location, wrong atmosphere, wrong attitude. You know, talking about the atmosphere, the, there's a story, isn't there, that if you put a frog into boiling hot water, I don't know which scientists found this out, but if you throw a frog into boiling hot water, it would just jump out of the hot water. But if you put a frog into cold water and you slowly boil it up on a, well, on a, on a cooker, then they will slowly boil to death. But when we talk about atmosphere, we're talking about the gossip, and we're talking about all the things, the influences, the swearing, and, and the things we can watch, we can watch stuff, and you can think, why am I thinking lustful things? Why, am I, why is that even in my brain? Well, what are you watching? Why have I got horror? Why have I got darkness? Why have I got all this stuff in my brain? What are you watching? 
What are you allowing to influence your brain? What are you allowing to go into your eyes? What are you allowing to impact and affect you? Because what, if you allow those things to be continuous, and you allow those people to be continuous in your life, you won't realise it, but you'll be slowly just boiling to death. And your comfort zone will kill you. If we don't realise that we need to be on our toes with Jesus all the time, that we need to be in a place where we're allowing him to keep us moving forward, that when we stay still, when we stop, is when we get comfortable, and then we can fall asleep and end up falling out of the window. 